Good evening, folks. Happy Wireworld Wednesday. This is Res Mason coming at you live from from the skybox in the far corner of the map. Nice day out. Not a cloud in the sky. I'm trying to be a little more structured today, so I'm just going to jump into. like a like an off the cuff explanation of why I'm doing what I'm doing. So, this is the Wireworld player. This is the flash version from 10 years ago. And I owe us an explanation of why 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 am I doing any of this stuff? why anyone did any of this stuff because you know I've done some of it but a lot of this is the work of other people and I want to make that clear and I want to kind of express what was going through their heads to my knowledge um, I want to answer the question why anyone would watch me making this in JavaScript and After that, maybe go into some guiding principles of what I set out to do. So, why am I doing this project? So, this stream, right, so Wireworld Wednesdays. Why am I doing this? Because I need to make Wireworld player in JavaScript, and because I want to program in a JS-like language in public. So why do I need to remake the Wireworld player? It's because Wireworld player flash doesn't work anymore. I mean, it works outside the browser. This uh, this app is a Flash app, but you know, you basically you can't install the Flash plugin anymore. You can't run. Um, sorry, you can't you can't officially install and run Flash content anymore. Um, it's been phased out for mostly for security reasons. Um, but before it did, this ran. Uh, pretty quick in the browser, and I want to do it again. Right, so I need to make Wireworld Player because Wireworld Player Flash doesn't work anymore, and also there's the alternatives aren't great or aren't online. So there are other things that do what the Wireworld player sets out to do, more or less. More or less. Like this, this play button that makes all the pixels evolve. There's other software that does that, but it's not online. Um, I should actually give an example. Um, Golly. Uh, <laughs> uh, Golly Cellular Automata. So Golly is a, you know what, I'll just run it, golly.app, and patterns wire world circuit. Here we go. So you know, here's an example of an app that's not mine, that somebody else made, that clearly can execute wire world, which I will explain in a little while. Um, why not point everyone to that? Well, because it's not online, which is not <laughs> which is not a heavy criticism. There's a lot of great software that's not online. Um, the advantage of doing something online is the speed at which people can get into it. For example, you know, 
drivey.js. So drivey is somebody else's project that I ported to JavaScript a couple years ago. You click it, you go to a website, boom, it's working, right? Didn't have to download anything. Didn't really have to explain anything in this case. Drivey is like a really cool self-contained concept. I do this sort of thing to a lot of self-contained concepts. Some things don't require too much explanation to be valuable to people, especially if you lower the boundaries, if you remove the boundaries, the obstacles between people and the content that you're creating. So this is my kind of thing, right? I like making things really easily accessible. And the way to do that is to make it an online experience. Right, so I should say that. Um, Wireworld as an online experience. It's so much easier to show somebody than to tell somebody how something works. And it's so much easier to show somebody something online rather than coax them to download it. Oh, I've got a visitor. Uh, here we go. Pixels here. Ciao from Fetty. Hi, Pixels there. Glad to have you aboard. Um, I'm not great at doing things and keeping an eye on chat, but I've given myself a lot of, uh, like, Oh yeah, cool. Um, yeah, multi multitasking is difficult for me, especially when the people who are trying to reach out to me are not tapping me on the shoulder or calling me on the phone. Uh, please don't call me on the phone. Um, but you know, uh, chat is so passive on Twitch that figuring out how to uh, do stuff in the stream and keep an eye on chat has been a bit of a, a bit of a journey for me, but I've I've got a trick up my sleeve, which is I have chat open not only on this computer in a separate window that I can check from time to time, but also on another machine uh, in the room that is in my periphery. So yeah, glad to have you. I'll try to keep an eye on any conversation that might spring up. Um, although again, no expectations. Right. So. Wire World is an online as an online experience to get people uh, ramped up real quick. Um, let's see. Right. So I was saying, Wire World Player Flash doesn't work anymore because Flash is uh, effectively gone. Um, right. And this is my work. So it's up to me to do it. Wireworld Player Flash was a Res Mason project, and this is a Res Mason project. Um, I want to program in a JavaScript-like language in public. Right. Um, I might go into this in further detail later, or just on Masto, off the stream. But um, there's been a conversation in my programming community about doing something, for example, programming something, finishing, writing a program, versus talking about it, which is what I'm doing now. Um, if I really wanted to get this done, I would just flat out, you know, turn off the stream and program the thing and put it on the internet. I've done that to some extent, right? If I go to resmason.github.io uh, wireworld player, like all this stuff, with very little exception, was done before I started streaming. This is just the second episode of this Wireworld Wednesdays series, so like, you know, sorry to say you missed, uh, you missed out on all this, but you didn't really miss out on much, because there's not much to talk about that I feel is particularly captivating, you know, significant. The reason I'm doing this in public is because I want to present programming realistically. And also, I want to present Wireworld 
engagedly? Is that a word? We're going with it. Uh, this wire world thing is bizarre, and it's intricate. Um, and it's got some interesting implications. <laughs> Thanks. Got a fan in chat who likes uh, engagedly. Uh, Mac OS does not like engagedly. But then, I don't 100% like Mac OS, so... Awkward. Anyway. Um, right, this is a weird and interesting system, and it's got... It, it's kind of a conversation piece. There's a lot of topics that are adjacent to it, like um, Computronium and the holographic principle. <laughs> what did I just say? Some other time. Um, you know, optimization of, uh, optimization of code in the browser. Um, balancing that with openness of code in the browser. Um, at the moment, it's really easy for anyone to kind of view the source code, right? And see what I'm doing behind the scenes. Uh, and that's valuable. People who are getting into programming or who want to understand what programmers do um, have technical barriers just due to the simple fact that when somebody programs something, they are not, their goal is generally not to share the workings of their process with, um, with outsiders, let alone people who aren't technically minded. So I want to, I want to lower those barriers. I want people to see, um, just plain old programming, uh, which is also its own, right. Um, I want to make programming palatable. There's actually a real creative challenge making live coding interesting. I've watched some YouTube videos where people have said, you know, going back and forth between writing text, right, and explaining what it is, and testing it, and debugging it, and fixing it, and, you know, making changes and all that, it's, it's something that interrupts the storytelling in a way that playing a game doesn't. Um, and on top of that, to expect somebody to watch you type as you focus on what you're typing and completely ignore them, it's just, it's a tough mix to get right. Um, but I want to give it a shot because we do need realistic and positive portrayals of programming. Speaking of realistic, right, um, I want to make mistakes in front of everyone. Um, you know, programmers are not ineffable, obviously. Bugs exist because people put them there. I like cheering people on sometimes. I appreciate that. Um, again, no pressure. Uh, I also like that. Um, there's another streamer called XRA. Here we go. XRA is working on a game in Unity. Uh, that's an oversimplification of what they are doing, but Memory of a Broken Dimension is this game that's been in the works uh, for a long time, and it's like a passion project, and I've watched this person uh, live stream their programming and their modeling and their designing uh, for years now, and, you know, I feel like I should probably list all the stuff I'm linking to. Whatever. Huh. Twitch decided to text me during my own stream. That's counterproductive. Anyway, um, there are things that I like about XRA's live streaming and my experience watching it that I would like to replicate to some extent, um, including the problem-solving process and the creative process, but also, you know, the code that I write is not definitive. 
when I write it, it's gonna be something that works and maybe something else will take its place because it works better. Bookmark of the timestamp. I am such a noob that I don't know what that is. Uh, welcome to a text file. Pixels here has been immortalized. Um, <laughs> okay, wavelength. Right, I still need to. Uh, I still need to get through this. So, so you get the idea. Why I'm motivated to program in public, but also the code needs to be kind of common slash accessible. Um, I've got friends who are working with less popular languages. I've got friends working on their own virtual machines with their own languages. And it's, it's magnificent, but I also want the work that I'm doing to have a kind of follow along potential so that if people want, they can fork my code, etc. Um, you shouldn't feel limited to a vicarious experience. If you want to try to do some programming on the Wireworld player, by all means, fork it. Um, I forget if I have licensed it, but chances are it'll be licensed in a way that uh, you're free to do whatever you want, as long as you don't, like, you know, <laughs> libel the people who have worked on its various bits and pieces over the years. Um, and I might use a license where it's like, if I like what you made, I'll just go ahead and incorporate that back into my project, thank you very much. Kind of Hakuna Matata situation. Um, okay, so... That's why I need to make Wireworld Player, and um, I want to program in a JS-like language in public. Now, there's another question, which is, yes, yes, but what is Wireworld, and why does it exist? Okay, I'm going to finally explain this stuff, and I'm going to use the Wireworld Player to help. <laughs> I'm going to read this out loud. Okay. Wireworld is a type of cellular automaton. This is a common cellular automaton. These pixels are doing what looks like a kind of intricate dance. But actually, every time this image changes, it's because there's a rule applied to every pixel in this image, in this grid. And that rule is specific to the neighborhood around each pixel. So basically, every frame of this animation, every pixel, looks at its eight neighbors. And depending on their color, chooses its next color. In this example, there are only two colors. Uh, figure and ground, black and white. Um, this is the rule set called Conway's Game of Life. I forget how old it is. Um, rest in peace. Conway was a brilliant mathematician who uh, also spoke about the cool things that he studied uh, and that other people studied. And um, this was something that people started with in like the 70s and 80s with uh, graphing paper and a pencil. And then they got uh, computer programs to automatically apply these rules to their images. And so they started exploring like what is possible. So there's a whole wiki, life wiki. There it is, bookmark, of course. And this is like a whole ecosystem. This, this word guns, what they mean are like things that emit patterns. So... Okay, pretty deep. There we go. So you see, in this image, there's a very rapidly evolving 
uh, system that keeps generating these things called gliders. And it basically emits them infinitely. And they just go on and on and on off the side of things, but presumably forever into whatever space, you know, is outside of this window. In other words, this pattern grows and grows and grows, and it gets bigger and bigger and bigger, infinitely. <laughs> and so if you want to evolve the pattern into deep time, you either need a whole lot of memory, right? Like tons of memory to just store the grid in the computer. Or you need to come up with some clever tricks to represent space, enormous space, in a small region of memory. And that's, that's something we'll get into way down the road. Regardless, um, you know, you can imagine you can build systems with this, like, uh, let's see, Conway's life in Conway's life. So this is somebody else's work. You can imagine how much work there is in this. Um, but here they have some gliders that are being emitted in this direction. Uh, and they collide with these. And as we zoom out, we'll see these are actually just meant to fill space. There's some, there's some emitters here on the edges. But this is basically just a billboard. And next to it is another billboard. And across the street here is another billboard. It's empty. And around them, there's a whole bunch of logic. And what does that logic do? Like, what do all these blinking lights on the edge do? They transfer information with, you know, these little gliders back and forth between each other to, <laughs> to run Conway's game of life. If we zoom out enough, If we zoom out enough, this is Conway's life running Conway's life. Actually, you can see around the edge, well, briefly anyway, you could see uh, the kind of loop that iterates over the neighbors to make a decision. This is what I mean when I say that these kind of interesting by the way this was uh philip bradbury's uh um philip bradbury's video um and i don't know what i'm gonna do with this text file but uh conway's life in conway's life so how does someone make something like this right well you need a program like golly that does some of the tricks I was talking about that allows you to zoom out so far and, you know, organize patterns like this across large portions of space. And, you know, as, as large as this seems, Golly and uh, some other Conway's Life programs can handle much, much larger systems. What's interesting about Wireworld, so you're thinking probably, oh, okay, so Wireworld's probably like a big deal. Actually, Wireworld has a unique property. I'll get back to the help menu in a second, but this, this diagram represents the permanent boundary of this system. Wireworld works in a way, here, I'll switch to the one that works, not that, that. The rules that govern Wireworld are kind of like Conway's. There are patterns that take place in certain parts of it, um, like this one. Oof. While it's running, it's uh, freezing up, probably because of OBS happening at the same time or something. Okay. So there's, there's some interesting patterns that are happening here, but everything that changes in Wireworld is constrained to this non-background, right? Everything that's this color in this image right now 
or is this dark dark green in this image, is permanently static. And that constrains the activity of this system to the width and height that it starts at. Which means there are certain things that you have to figure out clever tricks for in Conway's Game of Life that Wireworld does not require. Wireworld is limited, it's constrained, among other things, but it is, it is that way to our advantage. There might be ways to get Wireworld to run super fast because it's not going to blow up to be a million times bigger than it ever started with. I probably shouldn't have closed that. Anyway, so let me get back into it. Uh, these types of systems are called cellular... <clears throat> Just gonna... <sighs> I threw out my back looking for an iPhone cable like 30 minutes ago. So now we're gonna see whether there's any drug interactions between Advil and store brand cola. Store brand cola, for when you don't care what you're drinking about. Anyway, um, right, so this is a cellular automaton. Cellular meaning it's based on these cells, these little pixels, these are called cells. Automata meaning each one follows the same rules and doesn't depend on, you know, some kind of particular behavior aside from what it does locally. If you, th if you think about it, if somebody made like a little robot that looks at its eight robot neighbors, looks at their colors, their states, and decides what state it will be. If someone designed one of those and we just filled a room with them, they wouldn't need any logical organization other than the behavior I just described, which they all have, which is the same, and just having different neighbors, just being in a grid. So in that way, they are automata. Um, let's see, most of the explored cellular automata have a reputation for being interesting or relating to lifelong, uh, real life phenomena. <laughs> you know what, time to show off again. Um, smooth life. Okay, you see this. This is another Res Mason production, but it is somebody else's uh, uh, solution to an interesting problem. Somebody said, what if we made Conway's Game of Life and stuff like it? What if we made it so that it wasn't just black and white? And what if we also made it so that it didn't tick, so like the rules could apply partially per frame? And that's kind of what we're looking at here. This is called Smooth Life. Um, and it looks very organic, right? This is just a kind of further generalization of the organic behavior that we kind of saw in Conway's Game of Life originally. It's not all that different from, say, you know, microbes dancing around on a Petri dish. Especially when you, you know, allow for these, like, um, shades of gray. What's that? Why? What do you mean by partial ticks? Fair enough. So if we look at Conway's... Oh, you know what? I'll just open this again. It takes a minute to launch, but um, give me one second. Right, so I'll just zoom all the way in, in an interesting place. So when these systems evolve, they do it in steps. And each step in a classical cellular automaton is discrete. Every single cell changes its state from one of these states to another one of these states. And there's four states in Wireworld. In Conway's Game of Life, there's two states. In Smooth Life, there are 
many, many, many states. There, there's a continuum of states between, I guess, zero and one, where zero in this case is the background color and one is the bright green uh, color. Um, but the speed at which this system evolves is continuous. I don't have it here, but I could put a slider in the corner and like slow down and speed up time. And what that would do is essentially every frame of the animation, because this is still animating, um, every frame of the animation would be um, would be kind of a partial evolution of the previous state. So the same sort of decision-making process would take place where each cell would look at its neighbors and decide what color to be next. But it wouldn't just be one of four colors, it would be a continuum. And it would average the new color with the old color. In other words, this notion of a lockstep evolution of time is eliminated in Smooth Life. Like, it doesn't have to be. You can experiment with discrete time in Smooth Life. But, you know, this system allows for these things that are rigid in a classical cellular automaton to be smooth. That said, this system, you can't really, you can't really coerce it to do your bidding. Like, it's, it's very much organic. Um, one of the advantages of Wireworld... Uh, hey, Delanera. Hope I'm pronouncing that right. Glad to have you here. So, Wireworld is... Uh, it's chugging so slowly. I don't know if you're seeing this on the stream, but... I'm, uh... Just because flat, this is a Flash player from like 10 years ago, and so it's not optimized. But anyway, um... One of the design principles of Wireworld is to constrain the chaos to wires. And so the, the rule set... Um, I keep jumping ahead of myself. You know what? Let's, let's do it. So here's the rule set. There's four colors. There's four states, right? The most common state, this background state, is called the dead state. Dead cells are always dead. They never change. That's one of the reasons why we can think of them as like the furthest extent of this little simulated universe. There's nothing that's going to happen outside there, outside of this box. Then there's, as I'm sure you've noticed, zooming back in. You know what? I'm going to go to the copyright. There's a circle around the C in copyright, and I put some electrons on there. Chugging. Okay. I really haven't made this easy for myself. Here it is. Okay. Right. So you see this circle. Around the circle, there are three electrons. An electron isn't a real thing. It's a term for a pattern that we design Wireworld to exhibit. And so each one has a head and a tail, and each of those is a different state. So dead cells stay dead. Tail cells, which I think are these yellow, yellow ones? No, the orange ones, okay. So in this case, tail cells are the orange ones. Tail cells always become wire cells. These gray ones are wires. As you can see, wire cells don't really do anything, right? Like, they're just there. The main advantage of wire cells is they're the place where things can happen, whereas dead cells are the place where things can never happen. And so, as you can see, the orange cells always become gray in this uh, universe. Furthermore, the yellow cells always become orange. The yellow cells are called head cells. They always become tail cells. Like that. As you can see, these ones going around and around. Why does that happen? 
Like, why did why did you know why did the uh, designer of Wireworld, whose name is Brian Silverman, why did he decide on tail cells and head cells? It gives them directionality. The changes that happen in Wireworld propagate in the direction of the head, just by sheer simple fact that every head becomes a tail and every tail becomes a wire. There's this tiny little buffer of one pixel that prevents this pattern from stopping its, ca uh, its clockwise motion, changing and going counterclockwise. These three electrons, these emergent patterns, these electrons will always go clockwise because there's nothing connecting to the circle to allow them to change their course ever. Now there's a distance between this electron head and this electron tail, and this electron head and this electron tail, and so on. That distance will never change because they effectively go at the same speed. So that's cool. That explains... Oh my god, I'm zooming out. I'm gonna zoom out. Okay, and I'm gonna shrink the screen. Okay, just saving myself some trouble. Um, Flash was really struggling there. So that explains most of what we see here. Most of the yellow and orange dots that we see are electron head and tail pairs moving along a wire. But then there's some interesting stuff happening, like around here. Let me try to zoom in. Okay. So what's happening here? Oh, it's happening fast. Let me slow that down. Slow. A little bit faster. Okay. So what's going on here? Well, we've got a wire, and it goes into a structure, and there's a wire coming out of the structure, and over here, there's another wire going into the structure. Well, this little thing is kind of like a circuitry component. Based on the timing of these electrons, which you'll notice are all evenly spaced, right? There's kind of an even spacing across the whole universe. It's not imposed by the rules, but it's imposed by the designer. These components allow electrons to crash into each other and turn into zeros and ones. In other words, we can do digital logic with shapes of wires, and that is the fundamental basis of Wireworld. Why is Wireworld a thing? We are constraining the computational chaos of Conway's life and similar cellular automata. We're constraining them to circuits. And by we, I mean some other people, because I have never done this myself, with very few exceptions. I put those electrons on the copyright because I was being clever ten years ago. Um, everything else that you see here was either designed by uh, Owen and Moore, two people who collaborated on the Wireworld computer, which you see here, um, and someone else who... Uh, I'll link to it, but somebody else who... Um, programmed this particular computer to do something specific. Uh, and what is that thing? Maybe we can see. Just gonna run this computer and see what it does. It doesn't look like it's moving, but that's because I've sped it up by a multiple of the distance between electrons. So this computer is designed to have a distance of six between all the electrons. So by speeding it up by some multiple of six, a lot of the electrons don't look like they're moving at all. Let's see what it does. Okay, these, these numeric indicators up here just got a signal. Down here, by the way, on the bottom edge of this uh, of this version of the Wireworld player, you can see the number of steps into the future that we've simulated. So we just broke 110,000, and what's this? We see two. 
So the first thing that's been displayed on this Wireworld computer's output is two. I forget how long we have to wait for, for the next one. And you can see there's some interesting activity in this diagonal uh, structure. I won't go into all the details today on the design of the Wireworld computer. Just trying to show what it can do. I highly suspect that it can run orders of magnitude faster in a modern browser. This is just the best that um, Flash could do 10 years ago. We are 22,000 generations in. Any day now. By the way, if you look down here at this edge of the universe, there's a signal. Oh! There's a signal going down this channel, and now there's a new signal. Don't worry about catching the minutia. We're, there's, <laughs> this project is going to give us plenty of opportunities to look more closely at this stuff. So the screen cleared, and what's next? some point the display will change again to a three. I'm just gonna pause it there. If you haven't guessed, the Wireworld computer is programmed at the moment to, s to search for prime numbers. So it found three. I've seen it gone as far as 11 in Flash. In Gali, which, you know what, I might as well just show what Gali's, excuse me, what Gali's capable of. Patterns, Wire World, Primes MC. Um, so this is kind of like the, whoopsie, this is like the vertical layout of the same Wire World computer. Uh, just a smaller route between this diagonal structure and this double buffer and the display and stuff. Um, as you can see, this one's already started at, uh, at three digits. And if we click play, same as in the browser, but I can speed it up with this thing called hyperspeed. And if I click that, watch this. So it's at three, now it's at 5, 7, 11, 13, 17, 19, 21, 23, 35, not 35, those aren't primes. And now it's at like 79. So what is going on here? Well, somebody has come up with a very clever solution for basically zooming cellular automata into the deep future. Which again has philosophical implications based on um, what uh, mind-altering substances you've taken recently. So, it's actually my goal to implement that same logic myself, which I have never done before. Glad my stupid jokes are well received by chat. So, um, yeah, dead cells stay dead. Tail cells become wire cells. Head cells become tail cells. Wire cells, here's the clincher. So the logic is basically caused by this last rule. Wire cells that touch one or two heads become heads. The wire becomes excited. 
the pattern of electron signal goes through the wire, but only if they have one or two head cells. And the design of things in Wireworld takes advantage of that. Enormous advantage of that. You can imagine, if you have two electrons colliding in a certain way, um, if one of them is present, the signal from one of those electron wires could pass through a cell and get it excited. The other channel could do the same thing, but both of them... I'm doing... I'm, I'm relying kind of heavily on a... on a verbal explanation. F forget it. <laughs> Point is, um, we will see some of the examples of designs for components that make systems like Wireworld. Gonna get back to my motivations. So what is Wireworld and why does it exist? Wireworld is a cellular automaton that behaves. Doesn't wander off. Doesn't blow up. And kind of stays the course. Resembles circuits which are really just systems. I could just as easily say this is an elaborate flowchart. It really is an elaborate flowchart. The decisions that happen for every pixel, every frame, are not all that different from the sorts of decisions that occur in decision trees and flowcharts. The only difference is there are so many uh, pieces to this flowchart that information takes time to propagate from one side to the other, which again is beneficial because then we can like collide it in interesting ways. So by resembling circuits, we can think of these patterns as systems. We can take advantage of the fact that logic, which we usually think of as like lines of code, right? Like, like, let me just actually bring up my code for the first time in the stream. Like, we usually think of logic like this. This is logic. This is visual programming. It is arguably esoteric, but by having this visual layout, we can take conceptual shortcuts. We can take advantage of the fact that it resembles a physical thing, at least as designers. Um, so that's why Wireworld exists. Um, Owen Moore developed a computer made from Wireworld. Yeah, that's enough. So that's why it exists. Um, I missed something. But you know what? I'll write it down as a guiding principle instead. So, while I'm working on this, what are the principles I'm trying to follow? Um, make the code work, and... Well, I can write this better. The code has to be readable, simple, and practical. Uh, my coding style for this project and for a lot of my personal projects is what I am calling Binch Vanilla. Uh, vanilla JavaScript gets you away from the frameworks that come and go. Uh, you don't have to worry about, you know... Like, if I made this in React, React is pretty popular right now. Um, I guess it's been popular for the majority of the past decade. But, you know, before that, there were frameworks 
that were really popular. That now, if somebody getting started programming uh, clicks around and they go like, oh, hey, what's, what's jQuery? <laughs> and then some JavaScript programmer with a couple years of experience grumbles like, oh no, you don't want to, you don't want to fork that project if it's using jQuery, because jQuery's, you know, blah, 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 because it fell out of fashion, right? The, the solutions that it had for problems of the day um, maybe didn't map to modern problems, but also maybe people got sick of it the way that you can get sick of, you know, pinstripes on pants. So by avoiding frameworks altogether and writing vanilla JavaScript, I avoid that pitfall. Um, you know, there's, there's other fads that might be present in my code, but hopefully, hopefully by not using frameworks, we can get away from that. Also, you know, there's things like Facebook makes React, and maybe you don't like Facebook. You shouldn't feel the pressure of using something from a company you don't like, right, just because a project you really like adopted the framework. So getting away from frameworks. The only platform that I'm interested in is the browser. Uh, modern features. Um, Binge Vanilla uses arrow functions and async await where appropriate and, you know, destructuring of objects and arrays, again, where appropriate. Uh, probably some nullish coalescing. Here, here's the thing. I'm not afraid to use features of JavaScript that demonstrate to me that they are very effective at making the code easy to maintain and easy to modify to change its shape into something else. What else? Rich taste with caramel notes, that is subjective. Uh, short and sweet is what I'm aiming for, it's not always going to happen. And then, whatever I do, um, I pass the JavaScript and I think CSS through Prettier, which is, I guess it's in the name, it makes your code pretty. It causes code to conform to rules, so that no matter what I do on the stream, um, the way that the code is written across the project is consistent. So I'm aiming for the code to be readable, simple, and practical. What else? Right. Um, accessible UI. UX. Um, I went way down the rabbit hole about this in the last episode, the first episode of this stream. But all this UI, I'm hoping, um, allows people to use it uh, without um, without requiring a mouse. And probably without requiring a keyboard. Um, when I first made this, I was still a co college student when I made the Flash version. And uh, after building it, I turned it into a final project in a human computer interaction slash usability course. Um, it wasn't focused on accessibility in particular, just usability. Um, and in honor of that attempt, and in honor of who I think to be a pretty damn good professor, uh, Roger Grice at Rensselaer, now retired. I intend for, I mean, look, it's no longer Flash, right? This is just web stuff. So why not? Why not structure this to be semantic and accessible and you know, take advantage of some of the built-in accessibility features of HTML to the best of my ability. Um, so, accessible UI UX. Um, 
will improve over time. I don't think I got it 100% with the current implementation. Um, I'll probably reach out to various folks, read up on, like, uh, there's a, what's it called? Uh, there is a YouTube... Here we go. Um, in my free time, I'm watching some episodes of Alley Cats, Alley Casts, which is a, a, a Chrome developer uh, produced uh, accessibility series. Because um, look, accessibility benefits everyone, but that doesn't mean that I know what I'm doing just because I benefit from these accessibility features. What's that chat? Grab your name too, so I get a credit. Sounds like a plan. Not sure who this is, but I will definitely reach out. Thanks for the uh, thanks for the the reference. Best chat ever one or two people. So, um, what else? Guiding principles. Right. Make it fast. So there's, there's a lot of ways to make something fast in the browser, especially something that crunches numbers as intensively as this does. And we are going to consider a whole bunch of strategies. Sup, CL? Glad you could make it. So, make it fast. Um, obviously, there are uh, optimization strategies that are Wireworld specific. Um, so, there might be smarter ways, like work smarter, not harder. There might be some ways of reshaping the, the chore of, you know, updating all these uh, cells. Um, so that we're literally doing less work. Um, some of them hopefully will be apparent by the end of this uh, of this episode. Let's see, seven, 1929. So I've got two hours. Yeah. Hang on. Yeah. Okay. <laughs> I'm live for another two hours. Uh, my wife thinks that uh, programmers rely on math more than regular people. And I'm like, uh, hopefully not, because <laughs> I'm not always great at it. So yeah, by the end of this stream, I'll probably have a basic implementation, um, and we'll see that like there's definitely ways to work smarter um, with you know strategies that are Wireworld specific. But then there are JavaScript speed it up strategies. Uh, including ones that I've never worked with before or haven't worked with to solve problems of this sort. So uh, web workers um, and off-screen canvas. Um, I'm not expecting folks to know what these are yet, um, but you know, as I get used to uh, as I get used to these technologies on the stream, um, I guess I'll I'll res explain it <laughs> web workers web assembly modules um, which actually gets into another thing guiding principles transparent as possible as as transparent as possible I do like that you can view source on this and see exactly what's going on some of these optimization strategies will make the code harder to read. I'll try to comment the code so that it's easier to make sense of it at that point. Some of these JavaScript speeded up strategies do not have a show source, WebAssembly in particular. WebAssembly is practically machine code for browsers. Ain't nobody got time for that. You, you can't read machine code, or if, if you do, you've got a whole nother, 
you know, situation going. Um, and so I'm going to have to strike a balance with some of these, with these, some of these guiding principles, right? There might be um, JavaScript op optimizations that are not, um, that are not, uh, what's the word? That are not, that, that are, that are not compatible with some of the Wireworld specific optimization strategies. Um, there are some strategies that are not as compatible with transparency and so on, which is why I'm going to start with the basic transparent solution. Um, so, could it be readable, simple, practical, guiding principles, what else? There might be some more. I'm going to keep this text edit document in the background and quit out of that and write. Let's see where we left off in the actual code. So again, one HTML file, every pop-up and every text blob in every pop-up, everything is in index.html. And we just pepper it with, oh, this is new. I need to do this with everything. Um, adding metadata to those projects so that they, I guess, are better indexed and reach more people. Um, check this out. If I, uh, no, I don't have an example. In a social media app or a chat app, when you copy paste something like, you know, resumes and Wireworld Player, um, it expands in a cool way, you know? I just, I don't have any, si I, because this is my streaming user, I don't have Facebook or Twitter or, or, Mastodon accessible, but take my word for it. This stuff drives that. Um, so that instead of just looking like a URL, um, I get a billboard and, you know, the description and stuff. Enough about that. Let's dive into the code. Wireworld.js. Wireworld.js sets up a bunch of stuff. This is, this is the pattern of Binge Vanilla at the moment. I might change this. Um, at the moment, uh, so I'm using I'm using JavaScript modules to sort to uh, to organize the code, and so you know this utils.js contains a function called delay and a function called fetch local text and a function called fetch remote text, and it bundles them up and it says that's what you got. So if there's a if there's a module elsewhere that relies on it, those things can be imported by name. Um, modules are cool, but they're still just JavaScript, which is even cooler because like the order that this stuff is executed, it's just, <laughs> it can be as idiosyncratic as when you put JavaScript right in a web page. So some of this stuff, like it's like, oh, it's a module. It needs it needs like a life cycle where you you set it up and you tear it down. Well, no, there's only ever going to be one pan zoom module, and so I just let it like reach out and grab what it needs from the document, right? Sets itself up, and the only thing that it exposes is the function that some other module needs to call. So in a way, my modules have their own life cycle. Uh, Wireworld.js is an entry point, but then once it does all these imports, initialization of all these different components starts happening like behind the scenes. That might be a little cavalier. That's just the way that I'm doing things right now. Um, I can be convinced otherwise. It is a little weird, right? Um, I'd have to like... <laughs> read the standard to figure out whether there's ever any guarantee of a race condition not happening. Again, I'm rambling. Okay, so, Wireworld.js sets up a bunch of stuff, and then it calls load default URL, which uses get default URL from data.js. 
and depending on whether the page starts thin, like this, or wide, like that, well, there was no change there, so let me see why it's not. Is portrait screen orientation? Right, okay. So, <laughs> whether it does landscape or portrait is actually based on second. There we go. So right now it's pretending to be an iPhone 8, and if I hit refresh, you're kidding. Okay, maybe, maybe Safari's responsive mode doesn't tell the browser the screen orientation. Uh, wire world is portrait refresh is portrait is false screen orientation is undefined right okay so responsive design I gotta remember this this mode of Safari uh, is literally just a desktop browser pretending to be a mobile device it doesn't actually behave like a mobile device I'm not too worried about it. Point is, if a mobile device goes to the Wireworld player and the screen orientation is um, landscape primary, no wait, if it starts with portrait, then it's portrait. Um, otherwise, it's landscape. And the whole point of that is the portrait version of this is just a better fit, right? For more. So you got horizontal and vertical. Vertical. There we go. So, you know, on a phone that's being held in portrait mode, this would make... Um, there we go. This layout would make a little more sense. Is portrait... So the default URL is one of those, load, right. So load is an async function. <laughs> the first load shows the splash screen. I actually don't like that, I'll probably refactor that. Um, I should talk about what this is before the end of the stream. Um, So when it first loads, it shows the splash screen, and the next time it loads, it instead shows a sort of loading panel. And if it loads something that isn't even a, uh, like if I drop a folder in there. Load failed, couldn't load on more, right? Because I just passed something in that, uh... Vertical works on ungoogled Chromium. Ungoogled, ungoogled, oh, ungoogled Chromium, cool. Uh, if I do the F12 thing, cool. Glad to hear that. Um, yeah, I forgot another thing. <laughs> Whoopsie, which is guiding principles. Um, don't break the live build. So, so, um, because this is based on GitHub pages, uh, GitHub, ResMason, Wireworld Player, oh, that's AS3, one second. Wireworld Player. So, I guess you can't tell from the looks of it, but the repo is being hosted. When we go to resmason.github.io wireworld player, our repo is being used as a website, just based on how I set it up in GitHub. And that's actually really easy to, uh, to accomplish. Um, not sure if I'll ever show that on the stream because it requires signing in, which I'm trying to not do. Oh, right. Uh, don't dox thyself. 
My full name might show up from time to time on screen. I'm fine with that. I don't want uh, to, you know, make this about the real person behind Resmason because that is a bit of a distraction. And maybe because I want to, like, depict myself as, you know, a stand-in for the viewer. Anyway. Right, so it shows the splash and it hides it when it finishes loading. Um, the GUI gets reset. The paper, which is... Which is this thing. This thing is the paper. Gets set to new data. And then, right, the splash or the pop-up is hidden. So pretty, pretty straightforward. Um, also, to show the error pop-up, I'm literally relying on try-catch in an async. Um, async is interesting to the uninitiated. Uh, it's a modern feature of JavaScript uh, where um, the await keyword inside of async functions kind of puts the like applies the brakes on this function until the thing to the right of await resolves um, so for example um, you know here's some logic that says if the target of this load is a file then call fetch local text otherwise call fetch remote text on the target and we saw in utils.js fetch local text and fetch remote text create promises which are these sort of in what would you call it indeterminate ongoing things that at some point resolve so fetch local text says okay i've got a file reader i'm gonna set it up i'm gonna read the text in and then i will pass the result to the resolve function, which means fetch local text reads the target, and once it's done, it passes out the text of the target, and then await goes, oh, okay, and I'll pass it into the function over here, parse file. Um, and fetch remote text does the op uh, does the same thing, but with a different uh, with a different um, a different promise. So fetch local text and fetch remote text are asynchronous functions, or I think they're just functions that return a promise. We wait for that promise to be resolved or rejected. And when we resolve, it goes into parse file, which we'll look at in a minute. And then that gets thrown into the cache of loaded files. We set it in the GUI so that it shows up on screen. That's another function that we'll look at in a minute. Here, so uh, things to look at. Parse file. This is definitely one of the challenges of streaming live coding. Um, a whole lot of showing and telling and not a whole lot of programming. So I should switch things around before long because I do want to program. Um, right, that's another That's another reason why I, are, why I am programming in public. So, types of storytelling. Um, during this stream, I'm going to be doing some explanatory stuff. I'm going to be doing some exploratory stuff. I'm going to be doing my own research. Um, most of the time, even when somebody is trying to helpfully depict programming to somebody else, they don't bother to depict those times when the programmer doesn't know what they're doing, right? Needs to find things out themselves, needs to test things, makes a mistake, backtracks, all of that. Um, you know, debugging is a story, designing something is a story. Um, The reason, whoopsie. The reason storytelling matters to me is because, you know, stories are what we consume when we think about stuff that we don't have direct experience in. 
uh, I mean, we, we think of our own lives as stories that we reminisce about and maybe change a little bit over the years. But when we don't have firsthand experience about something in the first place, all that we consume are narratives told by other people. This is a big deal for me. It's like a, it's like a, it's like a Res Mason high level thing. Um, I want this project to convey things in various modes that just babbling about it or making a slide deck about it uh, doesn't accomplish. Anyway, so yeah, parse file, we're going to look at parse file. We're going to look at GUI set paper. I'm guessing, whoopsie, I'm guessing parse file yeah, it's from parse.js, so parse.js, parse file, gui.js, set paper. Just some code to look at. Um, and then write. So as I was saying, async function, these awaits, uh, have to, they like pause this function until the thing to the right of them is resolved. And then it picks back up where it left off, which is great. Most of the time when programmers, including JavaScript programmers, think of functions, they think of them as things that kind of flash from top to the bottom synchronously. Boom, I called load and all this stuff happened. Because if it doesn't reach the bottom, if it hangs, heaven forbid, the browser is going to choke on itself, the, you know, the vi excuse me, the... The visitor sees an ugly box that says, this tab is not responsive, right? Res Mason broke the internet rules kind of thing. We want to avoid that. So, um, async functions are kind of a new way of thinking about JavaScript. And yes, it definitely is purposeful in the way that like, it allows you to easily thread um, asynchronous things together. You know, fetching local text, fetching remote text, these are operations that usually take a long time, or they can take a long time. Um, parsing a file can take a long time, although that's synchronous. But regardless, um, async not only loosens these synchronous constraints on JavaScript, it also allows us to think of this as a story that is paused and is then resumed and paused and resumed, etc. Um, and it also, you know, so like in the in the case of an async function, this try catch is not something that we are attempting in a flash. It's something that can that can fail at any point, right? In the time it takes to fetch this stuff um, and for this pop-up to resolve, this delay. And then it, like, if it turns out, oh, there's an error, then we can show another UI element for that. To me, this is a very intuitive kind of thing. It's like a, it's like a casual sauntering rather than the crashing of you know a synchronous waterfall of code we just kind of wander down here uh, you know uh, maybe we show the flash splash you know we gotta wait till we fetch and then etc anyway enough about that parse js so Export default. I see. I might be getting away from export default. Like so. Export. Const parse file equals. Parse file. Limit that search to JavaScript, please. Someone wrote a post somewhere uh, that convinced me earlier this morning to get away from some of the uh, export defaults. Explicit export of the elements in a module 
makes it a little bit easier for a module to um, to enforce its API. So it's like, why not? Let's just do that. Uh, export default GUI. Um, const GUI equals and then export GUI. And then up here, open. And then again, import GUI only there. It's just a tiny, tiny bit cleaner. Um, okay, so parse JS, parse file. Parse JS, parse file. A file comes in, it can be in one of two formats. Uh, parse MCL, which we're not going to look into because it's just a little gross. Parse TXT. So we try one. It will immediately fail if it's the if it isn't an MCL file. So that we immediately try parse TXT, and that will immediately fail if it's not a TXT file. If they fail, then data is null. We throw an error. That error and this error message, you may recall, is exposed in an error pop-up. So throw new error is actually a useful apparatus for exposing problems to the player in this case. We don't have to, you know, be like, you know, uh, pop-up manager dot instance dot create pop-up, you know, simple pop-up dot generic and like none of that. We're just throwing an error. Um, because in a project of this scope, we can be confident that it gets caught right here, right, right here, and boom, shunted into an error pop-up where it belongs. Um, now, the data can parse successfully, but be too large in width or height. So width exceeds or height exceeds. Let me find out what the max length is. 2048. <laughs> yeah, this is arbitrary. To do, base this on something, anything. Um, but I do want there to be a max length. Um, mostly because, you know, Wireworld is a, like I said before, it is a constrained system. It shouldn't be gargantuan. And if it is, then... I mean, I don't know. I, I honestly think that... If the max length gets too big, then it becomes very easy to exceed the... kind of the, the goals of the project. I don't know. Anyway. Uh, let's look at parse txt. So what do these examples look like anyway? Well, let me go into adder.txt. Here's adder.txt. If I drag this and drop it into the Wireworld player, there it is. So we see some inputs and some outputs, and this is an adder, or maybe a half adder. I forget, probably, yeah, probably an adder. Uh, this is a three bit number, and this is a three bit number, and the output is a one, two, three, four, five bit number. Uh, that I can't run yet, because none of it works yet. Um, and we can see it here. We get an, appro an approximate length and width, uh, width and height. So this is, down here it says 69 characters. And what do we see? We see a bunch of different uh, symbols, right? So if I copy all these and paste them into a different file, and grab every symbol and give it its own line and get rid of duplicates. Oh, whoops, what is this? Well, that's weird. Let's try this one more time. Um, you know what, I will grab every symbol that is not a space. 
I'm trying to prove a point here. Okay. Every symbol that is not white space. Paste. And get rid of the duplicates. And these are the digits that were the width and height. So we're left with three symbols. So we know, we can see that empty space, the dead cells, are just spaces. Fine. That's great. Um, but then there are a whole bunch of pound symbols. Well, pound symbol is wire. That makes sense. There's so many of them. It's got to be wire. If a cell isn't dead, it's probably a wire, right? Most, most of the wire world computer is wire. And then there's this little tadpole kind of thing, or at least it's supposed to look like a tadpole. It doesn't always look like one. Like this looks kind of like the fish, the radioactive fish with three eyes from The Simpsons. Whereas this is a pretty ordinary cyclops tadpole. Um, it's got a head, it's got a tail. So we know it's going in this direction. Just by looking at it. Uh, this one, head, tail. It's going in this direction. And it probably goes around like that. Um, around like that. And so, we know tilde equals tail. That symbol equals head. So in parse txt, first thing we do is we get rid of uh, a whole bunch of white space with a regular expression. We return early if the data is empty. And then, well, let's follow this. File, so adder.txt is the file. We have file, oh, also, let's see, file that match. that's decimal. So this, let me just use this regular expression in here. Search, get rid of that, get rid of that. So there's all that. And we are just going to Hang on. Not a number space. Oh, no, no, sorry. Beginning number, other number, white space. Oh, this doesn't do new line and this does. Okay. So I'm going to replace this with pound. There we go. So this line gets rid of all of that, and we're left with that. And then cells is file, which is this whole thing. Hang on. File. Dot split on new line, which means every new line is now like a uh, I gotta change this one second because it's trying to do clever stuff that maybe get rid of word wrap I think that's it okay so we've split all the lines. This is not going great, is it? Okay, so... all the lines into their own uh, rows, and then each line, we go through every single character in the line. So for example, if we go for this line, like that, 
we look up the character, oh, sorry, we look up the state in characters to states of that character. And if we don't find one, then it's dead. So, this basically means, okay, all of the spaces are dead. So, if I go into here and I look for every space, I'll replace it with D for dead. Uh, you know what? Let's do emoji. Skull. Dead. Um, pound becomes a wire, so all the pound I will replace with uh, wire. And then all the tails become tail. Not a whole lot of emoji for tail. Cat. Cat says chat. Cat. Whale. Okay. Yes. You know what? Whale. Uh, animal. Where's the search? Whale. Cute whale. And then tail is head. I don't think that helped me make my point at all, but you get the idea. Here is now a single row that has been turned into the states of the cells that are in that row. Oops, I did this in adder.txt. Okay. Back to where it was. So, all these rows got converted into their states, right? And then, yeah, so the result is basically something like this, where in JavaScript, Yeah, now I'm just cheating. Uh, do, 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 comma. Turn off wire word wrap. <laughs> okay. Like. That. So it basically turned it into this, right? Where again, all the spaces dead, all the pounds are wire, all the tails are tail, and all the heads are head. And that is the raw data that uh, parse.txt and parse.mcl uh, return. What does set paper do with it? So GUI.js, set paper. So data is a width number and a height number and that array of cells, that two-dimensional array of cells. Num bytes. So what we're looking at here, this image, has to have a red, green, blue, and alpha value for every pixel. And the size of each value is a byte. So for example, this yellow pixel has a red byte of full brightness, which is, I think, let's see, eight bits in a byte, so 15? Yeah. No, I am, hang on. Hundred twenty seven. Okay. Even that seems wrong. Whatever. So it's got full brightness red, full brightness green, no brightness blue. That's what yellow is. Oh, and um, full alpha. 
And so to store all four of those colors next to each other for every pixel, we need to take the number of columns, which is the width, times the number of rows, which is the height, times red, green, blue, alpha, which is four. So numbytes is numbytes in image. And so this code is responsible for drawing this image. Uh, quick surprise, this is not just one image. Um, drag region paper. Here we go. Toggle. this. So what we're looking at right now is a single image called the base image. On top of that, we have the tail image that just contains tail pixels and the head image which just, <clears throat> which, just gonna <clears throat> which just contains head pixels. Um, this is kind of jumping the gun, but there is an optimization strategy that I used 10 years ago in the Flash version of this project that basically, because here, here's the thing, we know that every tail becomes a wire. We know that every head becomes a tail. And we know that some of the wires become heads. So if we want to draw all of the new tail pixels, we can just redraw the old head pixels. So this is an optimization strategy that I just jumped the gun on. It's, I'll, I'll probably, I don't know, we'll see whether we're going to keep this, but um, in set paper, Depending on whether it is dead, tail, head, or wire, we're gonna draw. Big brain pixels is here says, not not quite jumping the. I might have that I might have shot myself in the foot so to speak. Um, but yeah, the the pixels that need to change are wire and uh, are sorry are head and tail, so. Um, the ones that don't change, wire and dead, can just be like relegated to this background image. And we only have to update these, uh, these first ones. You know what, I'm going to change that right now. I'm going to comment that out, index.html, uh, base tail head, I'm going to call this base one, okay, so GUIJS. Set paper drawings is from entries. Okay, so drawings dot tail dot style equals display none. Drawings head style is display none. Oh, whoops. This whole time I've been loading it from GitHub. Hang on. Oh, uh, yes, I would like to upgrade. Okay. Right, let's try this again. CD, Wireworld repo, run, Python simple server. So now it is local. Okay. Canvas context image data buffer pixels. I'm going to throw in here canvas. So now drawings dot head and tail dot canvas dot style equals display none. There we go. So for the time being, that's enough 
of that smart Alec behavior from you. Bad comment. Uh, commented out for now. Um, comments it out for basic implementation. Okay. So as I was saying, we look at every row. Uh, if the row isn't null, then, which is just a weird edge case that I wanted to make sure we don't bump into, um, but can happen from time to time. Uh, for every column in the row, we get the cell state uh, defaulting to dead. The index, which is how far along the list of pixels in the image, um, is width times the row plus j. I should call these x and y. Let x, x, x. Oh, that's y. <laughs> y, y, y. Y, Y. I think that's it. Yep. And then J. X. X, 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 X. Okay. That still runs, doesn't it? Yes, it does. Okay. A little bit easier to make sense of that. So, for every row, for every column, we get the cell state, we get the index. Um, so a, a canvas image just like this one in HTML5 is just a list of colors, right? The pixel values I was talking about. And that list starts in the top left and then marches horizontally to the end of the top row of pixels. And then it goes to the second row of pixels and it does it again from left to right, left to right, left to right, until it reaches the very bottom. So the index of a pixel in this image is the number of pixels that come before it if you were to take every row and line them up uh, next to each other from start to finish. That's what that code does. Right, and then we do this. I'm gonna comment this out. And we're gonna say, um, switch state case cell state dot dead which is the most common one um, let color color equals dead color break Do I want to do this with a switch case? No, I'm not feeling it. Okay, so just like in data.js, no, just like in parse.js, we have this text cares to states. In GUI.js, we can have const uh, states to colors equals new map um, and the keys to the map are the states and the values will uh, we'll grab from here Dead color, wire color, tail color, head color. Cool. Yep. States to colors. And then in here, we're going to say uh, const color equals states to colors dot get uh, state. Yep. 
Yep. And then this. Drawings.base.pixels index equals color. Let's try that. Yep, that worked. Okay, much simpler code. It's not so weird. Okay. So I'll call this pixel index. Yep. Cell state. Nah, just cell. There's, oh, states, I see. Hmm. Yeah, state's fine. Color, pixel index. Okay. You know what? I will just get rid of these. Comment out, comment out. Okay. So, let me just look at this. We initialize the canvas. Right. Anytime you have a canvas in HTML5, uh, you need, if you want to draw in it, you need to get its 2D context and create an image data object, which is what we are uh, populating with the pixel data that we put in here. And that image data ends up being what you put inside the canvas's context. It seems a little convoluted, but this is... I don't know, this, this API has existed for over 10 years, I'm not going to read into how it was designed. I think it's, I think it's pretty reasonable. The thing is, um, we need this play button to work, don't we? And set paper, why is it in GUI JS? It's kind of strange, right? For one thing, drawings can be out here. Wait a minute. This is called every time the image changes. And this is a lot of w work for when it changes. So we're going to say, we're going to make a new, um, hmm. What we want, so back in Wireworld JS, we have these event listeners to events that are broadcast from the GUI from these buttons. Play and pause, for instance. Um, we want to... Let's see, so GUI JS advance event is from step Reset is from stop. State changed event. It's from pretty much everything.
Okay, so... State... GUI.state.playing Advance Step and that's just stop. Okay. And speed. State changed event. To do GUI dot state dot speed. Here, it's really all of these, isn't it? to do gui.state.playing turbo speed we aren't at all interested in playing under pop up okay so for tonight We kind of want, like, what what it's got right now is the looks, but no brains. We need a brain. Ten years ago, I called it a brain because it's a cute name to give a piece of code. Um, I'm trying to avoid cute names for code nowadays because cute names aren't functional. Um, so I'm going to call it uh, Engine. There it is. Right, okay. Playing turbo and speed. The turbo button, by the way, is just this funky radioactive thing which is meant to uh, represent the kind of going super fast mode. Um, because, you know, most of the time when you're running Wire World, even at maximum speed, top speed, um, you just want it to uh, evolve at about the rate, like the, the frame rate of the screen or something like that. Um, turbo is meant to... Uh, use some of the JavaScript optimizations to make it go even faster. So playing turbo and speed all actually govern the rate at which the engine updates. So I'm going to do this. Um, set cadence. So cadence let me make sure I know what I'm how like what that word actually means. Sequence of notes. Rhythm. I should say rhythm. Set. I just saw it on screen and I have no idea how to spell it. Rhythm. Is that spell check? Here. Rhythm. Guess so. Okay. Set rhythm. Const. Equals GUI dot state. Playing speed turbo. Import set rhythm from 
engine.js. Okay, advance. Um, advance. <laughs> and then reset sim, reset sim. No, just reset engine. Engine dot reset. Engine dot advance. Engine dot set rhythm. That's more like it. Import engine from engine.js. That's more like it. Okay. Yeah. I could collapse these. I will. I will collapse these. What Wireworld is? Hi, Coder Learner. Um, I'm trying to get better and better at saying it succinctly. I will show you what Wireworld is. Wireworld is a picture where all the pixels have four colors. And the picture animates by applying four rules to the four colors. The first rule, oh boy, hang on. Please behave. Uh, I should point out, this is the old Flash, the Flash version of the Wireworld player, and I'm making the JavaScript version, which will be faster and more responsive. So the rules are that these, they're called dead cells, these dead cells back here never change. These orange cells always become gray ones. The yellow cells always become orange. And gray cells get excited into becoming yellow cells if they have one or two yellow neighbors. And that rule allows us to treat these things as information signals traveling along a wire and getting um, processed like this. So information is traveling through this wire world instance. And the rules are applying to every single square in this grid uniformly. And the shape of the things in this grid were designed to channel these signals in ways much like a digital circuit that perform logic. And with enough of that logic put together, it can perform mathematics. Um, down here is a whole bunch of mathematics, I think. So I've been told. Um, and so by running Wireworld, we learn a little bit about how our world works and how circuits can be designed and philosophical implications about what it means for complex results to happen from something so simple as the four rules that I just described. So that's Wireworld. And Wireworld Player is meant to do Wireworld in modern browsers, on desktop and on mobile. Mobile needs some work. Um, as it says in the splash, this project currently has no implementation. Sounds like Game of Life by Conway, but more useful. Exactly. Um, Conway is useful. I, I would say they're equally useful. In the, I know what you mean by useful. There's there's a practicality to constraining the chaos in Conway's Game of Life. Um, they're both universal. In other words, with the proper setup, a setup similar to this one, both can compute anything that is computable. 
They are Turing complete. Yes, that Turing. This Turing. Uh, that Turing. So, um, you just need to run it. <laughs> you just need to have some script that does what it needs, that needs to be done. So that's what this engine is going to be. All the code that actually evolves, that, that applies the rules, is going to be in this engine.js. So engine, advance, engine reset, engine set rhythm. So in engine.js, export, set rhythm, advance, uh, reset. Yep. Just going to grab each one of those. Const equals There we go. Uh, and that will just run without errors. <laughs> oh, nope, error. Engine is not found. Um, oh, right. B -b 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 -bum. Engine. Const engine equals... There we go. console.log and we know in here that there's what is it is playing I'll just grab it playing oh here <laughs> gui.state yes And we're just interested in playing, speed, and turbo. Playing, speed, turbo. Advance, reset. Cool. Set rhythm, false, zero, false. Set rhythm, false, zero, false. As I adjust the speed, thanks for the follow. I don't know if I've thanked anyone before for a follow because this is brand new. Uh, glad you could stop by. So yeah, now the engine is getting live information from the UI. Cool. Reset. Okay. Another thing that we need is initialize. Const initialize equals, and this is going to get the stuff that set paper currently gets. Width height cells. Done with that. Width height cells. Let width height cells. Let's try this. Data width height cells equals data. Deconstruct. Does that work? So sometimes, like in this case, one browser is not great at debugging an issue, so I pop open another browser. Let's try it in Firefox. And let's lay them out the same way. Doc to write. Engine, line four. I could have swore that this is how destructuring works. Yeah, interesting. Object destructuring. Boom. 
Okay, maybe it needs to go inside parentheses. That's interesting. Oh my god. Learn something new every day. Eureka. This threw runtime errors because it wasn't in parentheses. Anyway, all this does is it takes the width, height, and cells from data and populates them into the local values. Um, which is good. Excellent. Way to go, Pixels here. Thanks for hanging out. Um, if you're uh, if you're departing, it was nice hanging out with you. And thanks again for those uh, for those cliff notes on uh, finding someone to talk to about A11Y. And well, that's a <laughs> that's a reference to this actual notepad. Yep. Um, yeah, I'll get better at this uh, this stream stuff as uh, as I continue to stream. Okay, so the engine now knows what the original data is. Yeah, good night. Um, width and height never change. Cells do. And so, for this basic implementation, I am going to do this, original cells, original cells equals, if we just do original cells equals cells, then we have a problem. Um, the idea of original cells is I want, like, an easy way to, um, to reset. And so I need two copies of the cells. The one that changes, which is called cells, and... Let's see. I'll do this. Original cells equals data.cells. Eh, whatever. Original cells is data.cells. Width equals data.width. Nothing wrong with this. Height equals data dot height, and cells equals original cells, which is a two D array dot map row row dot slice console dot log cells original cells. There we go. And then in here, actually, uh, reset. And let, okay, so original cells generation. Reset generation equals zero. Cells equals original cells dot map row row slice. False speed equals one, I think, and then turbo equals false. Uh, 
const was playing equals playing if playing and was playing. So if we if so set rhythm can turn the simulation on and off. So if it wasn't running, if it wasn't playing, sorry, if it wasn't playing and it is now, then we're gonna do set timeout. No, we're gonna do start. Yep, const start equals. And the reason we do this is because depending on the speed, we'll either use a set timeout or a an, um, a um, request animation frame. So we're going to set our max speed to basically Eh, I'm overthinking this. For now, we're just going to do request animation frame. So we're going to do advance and advance, advances, and then if playing request animation frame. If not playing, return. There we go. Nope. Let's see. Advance. This is better. Okay. Yep. Okay. Let's try this out. Advance, advance, advance play, and now it's advancing a whole bunch, pause, it stopped advancing, step, it advanced again, and reset, that's something to, that's something to fix, look at that. Bug report, <laughs> Firefox. renders the focus on pop-up buttons as a label. Just open any pop-up in Firefox. Gee whiz. <laughs> That's silly. Okay, confirm reset. Original cells is undefined. Um, I was in here, right. Original cells. Interesting. Oh, initialize was never called. That's why. Okay. So wire world can't just set paper. It also needs to say engine dot initialize data. Another thing it needs to do is connect the engine to the GUI so that when the simulation advances, we update the paper. We will get to that in a little bit. Okay. Stop. Okay, cool, okay. Um, back in the engine, we are going to look at 
uh, console.log cells. There we go. It is an array of 600, which makes sense because I happen to know the height of this is 600. And each of these, array 8. Oh. No, no, that doesn't make sense. This is an array of arrays, so... Zero. Array eight. Why eight? Oh, right, it's sparse. Sparse array, my bad. Yep. So, if I do say 100. Yeah, 736. Okay. So the cells data is sparse, which we don't want. So we're going to do this. Original cells is data.cells dot map row. If row dot length, let's see. We're going to do row dot length is equal to width, then row. No sense in doing that. Okay. So we want to return the row. Dot can cat. Here we go. An array of length width minus row dot length. So if the row is too short, if the row is only like five, then we'll take five away from the width, which in this case is like 800. So that leaves us with 795. We make an array that's 75, uh, sorry, 795 long. Dot fill cell state dot dead. That's what we want. And we can represent it like that. Okay, let's just see what that looks like. Cell state not defined, that makes sense. Uh, utils has, no it doesn't. Data, data has cell state, okay. Um, you know what? Import cell state from data.js. There we go. Console.log cells. There we go. From the looks of it, every single row now has a width of 800. That's what we want. Whole bunch of threes. Cool. Um, if we look at the hundredth row, any second now. Wow. Okay, this doesn't seem right. Row can cat. Thought so. So I'm using can cat properly. Here's what I'll do. I'm going to turn cells into cells.map row row.join dot join new line. So this will just print it all out like that. Oh, 
Okay, there's some. And if I stretch this out, and if I zoom out to reduce the width, there we go. We can see patterns that correspond more or less to some of the patterns that we can see visibly in the image. Not a great debug tool. This is good though. Ah, we also want, so we've got cells A and cells B, cells A, and then cells B. So now we've got two separate uh, copies of the same data. Um, and we're also going to say um, flip, not flip. Um, no, you know what? Not cells A and cells B. Cells, uh, here, old cells, new cells, original cells. Okay, there we go. So we've got old cells. We've got new cells. Okay. And now advance does something funny. Advance says, let cells swap. Let swap equal old cells. New cells equals old cells, old cells equals swap. So we swap the old and new cells. And then for let um, for let y equals zero, y is less than height y plus plus, for let x equals zero, x is less than width, x plus plus. In other words, for every row, for every column, we've got a cell. Const old state equals old cells y x. Switch old state. So we need to handle the old state of every cell. So case cell state dot dead. Break. We, they, they don't change. No change. Case cell state dot tail. New cells, y, x equals cell state dot wire. Because remember, every tail becomes a wire. Case, cell state dot head. Just gonna copy paste this. New cells, y, x equals tail. And then lastly, case cell state dot wire and now we need to look at the eight neighbors around this cell right so we are going to call them uh, const what's a good way to do this you know what because because this is our naive implementation, we are going to throw in two more for loops for 
let uh, row equal negative one. Row is less than two. No, that's not too readable. So actually I'm gonna do this. Um, let count, let num head neighbors equal zero. Num head neighbors if Boy, this is gross. We need to look at all of the neighbors of the cell. You know what? We, we will do a for loop. For y2 equals y minus 1. No, I'm just going to do minus 1. y2 is less than 2 y2 plus plus for oopsie let for let x2 equals minus 1 x2 is less than 2 x2 plus plus okay so now we're looking at okay so const neighbor state equals old cells Okay, hang on. If y plus y2 is less than zero, or y plus y2 is greater than or equal to width, continue. So we have to I mean, arguably, we have to worry about border conditions. So the operations that we're doing right now are are spatial. We're basically saying for every pixel, if it's a wire, then, ooh, look at your neighbors. But there's a chance that you're on the edge because there's such a thing as edges. Um, so, you know, maybe there's a way of thinking about... Uh, the neighbors of a cell so that we don't have to worry about edges, right? Because this bunch of logic and this bunch of logic would then be unnecessary. So if y plus y2 is less than zero, or y plus y2 is greater than or equal to width, and then here greater than or equal to height, then we continue. Okay. If old cells y plus y2 x plus x2 is cell state dot head then num head neighbors plus plus I forget if we can label hang on MDN break label good so MDN label statement loop one cool okay so uh, neighbor counting colon and then if num head neighbors is greater than uh, is equal to 3 which means there's too many then break label uh, neighbor counting okay so oof gross if num head neighbors is equal to 1 or num head neighbors is equal to 2 then and only then new cells I oh yeah hang on new cells y x equals old state 
that's the default, so we'll just set it there. And then here, new cells yx equals cell state dot head. And this is kind of what we expected, right? To advance the simulation, dead cells stay dead, wires become, uh, sorry, tails become wires, heads become tails, and wires have to count their neighbors. Uh, right. Also, if y2 is equal to zero and y1 is equal to zero. Continue. So we don't count ourselves. Except we can count ourselves because the wire cell is always going to be a wire. Um, whatever. X2. Okay. So this is our. <laughs> This is our gross advance function. We have old cells and new cells, so we never have to like make a duplicate of the current state. We just swap the old and new ones. Um, I think I messed this up, one second. Swap is old cells. Old cells equals new cells. New cells equals swap, there we go, okay. And then, for every cell, apply the rules. No change. And this one, tail to head, uh, sorry, tail to wire. Here, dead to dead. Here, head to tail, then here, wire might lead to head with one or two head neighbors. Otherwise, wire. I'm just making up a notation here, it doesn't matter. Um, yeah, gross. I'm just gonna click advance and see what happens. Cool. Um, also in advance, uh, generation plus plus. So we increment the generation. Um, and we're also going to do draw to, draw to. Engine is going to have a draw to function. Um, is it? No, it's not. <laughs> no, engine is going to draw directly to the image data. So, you know what? I would just like to see this actually working first, though. So, console.log, new cells, dot map, row, row dot join, nope, row dot map, uh, state, join dot join so again this just prints out the 2d array there might be a better way through some other methods on console but I'm grabbing this 2d array I'm mapping its rows to strings and then I'm joining the strings with a new line 
Advance. There it is. Can't really see what's going on. Um, but if I load in a simpler example, we just might be able to. Advance. There it is. That's that's very difficult to make any sense of. Um, I'm going to add that map function after all. Map uh, state and then state we're going to reverse this text carries to states. We're going to do states to cares. What is that? An object? State. Try that, and of course in here, const states to cares, and then that. Let's try it. Advance. Look at that. As we advance, the logic is applying. Right down there. That's pretty cool. But it's not drawing to the screen. So now we need to have a kind of drawing system passed into Engine.js. Set paper. in GUI.setPaper. So initialize gets the draw to function. That's what we'll call it. Let draw to. Um, underscore. I try to avoid that. Nope, other way around. Gross. I'll try to I'll try to live with that. <laughs> so in advance, we are now going to draw to width height old uh, new cells. Let's just see what that does. Put an adder, advance, nope, runtime error. Cells is undefined. Um, oh, right, this needs to be called cells. Cells. Let's try that again. Throw in the adder, advance, look at that. With 20 minutes to spare in this episode, we actually have a working whatchamacallit. Um, although it didn't reset properly. That's easy to fix. Draw to. Uh, we can hide that. And then get rid of the states to cares because we're not printing it. Uh, reset. Draw to. Okay, and now, you know what, let's try it on the big one. Advance, 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 advance. And it's working. Now let's click play. Look at that. 
job done, right? Well, no. It's probably pretty slow, actually. Um... I can hear and feel my laptop heating up enormously, which makes sense. Uh, I can't zoom and then advance because of the set paper implementation. So let me try this. Uh, we're going to do const... well, hang on. So const initialize paper equals width height. And do we have any lets in here? We don't. Okay. So right here, we're going to do let drawings. And then in here, drawings equals. So this initializes the canvas stuff. We can just do this. With type. Now you know what? Data. And then const with height is data. That initializes the drawings. And then that's fine. Set pan zoom size with height. And then this is going to be called update paper. And then down here, we replace set paper with initialize paper and update paper. And then in wire world, we're going to do GUI dot initialize paper and then GUI dot update paper. Let's try that. Load failed. Let's see. Initialize paper, line two twenty five. GUI line two twenty five. Numbytes is not defined. Oh! No, that should work. Okay, hang on, hang on, hang on. We know that the error is downstream of... Data has a width and a height. Great. Numbytes. Where the heck did numbytes come from? <laughs> Oopsie. Numbytes. Oh. Okay. Is this used anywhere else? Nope. Okay. Easy fix. Uh, how do I delete breakpoints? Like that? Yes. There we go. Zoom in. Advance. Play. Cool. 
So again, this is potentially the worst implementation I could come up with. And that's fine. JavaScript runs plenty fast. Uh, speed controls are not doing anything. Turbo, it's like, who cares? Um, pause, advance, reset. There is a ton of stuff we could do to not just make this more functional, but actually more performant. Like I said, this engine that I built this, this evening is a brute force approach. Oh, you know what? I left out a break. By the way, uh, right before the stream ends, um, let's see, index, we commented that stuff out. Engine, we added that. Uh, GUI, we turned set paper into initialize paper and update paper. Uh, parse, we just cleaned it up a little bit. Uh, wire world, we just cleaned it up a little bit. Um, so these are all of our changes. I haven't committed and pushed them yet. Um, but... Let's see what happens when I run the prettier command on this directory. So, understandably, the files I didn't touch are no different than they were before. Um, some of the files that I did touch haven't been changed, which is fine. Um, because, you know, by and large, the changes that you make, like the small changes you make to a file, uh, don't require to be, like, don't require rewriting. But I made some substantial changes to GUI, and I made some substantial changes to Engine. So let's see what those changes, uh, what, what prescribed change, <laughs> what prescribed changes there are from Prettier. Prettier suggests a semicolon, um, not suggests, it made, it added a semicolon where I didn't have one. Cool. Same thing here. Um, my label for the outer loop in the engine, uh, prettier put it on the same line in the for loop. That's cool. Stage that. Uh, what's different here? It surrounded the um, the argument, uh, the 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 input of these little methods in parentheses error encountered source tree sometimes does this I'm not too worried about that because I can just drag it into there um, put these on separate lines whatever and it put this whole thing on the same line okay just gonna push this cool gonna give it a name um, created engine.js, which is created engine.js, the module that does all the hard work. Um, split GUI set paper into initialize paper. Is that what I called it? Yes, initialize paper, and um, really it's like resize paper. Let's look at it again. Yeah, but it also sets the pan zoom size. Whatever. Into initialize paper and update paper. The latter. Um, Update paper is called from within engine.js whenever the canvas needs updating. Cool. So, there's a whole lot of stuff going on in engine's advance function that arguably doesn't have to. Right. Um, we want to make this fast. It's nice that it works at all right now. That's great. 
So if you were ever wondering whether you could write something like Wireworld, um, if you can understand this code, right, for every row, for every column, look at the old state and apply the rules to the old state to come up with the new state. Like the hardest part really is this gross nested for loop that uh, that iterates over the neighbors, right? These could be slightly better names. Y2, I'll say row. No, I'll say Y offset. And X2, I'll call column offset. And we will rerun Prettier. No difference. We will test it again. Doesn't explode. Let's test this on other browsers. Let's see what Safari thinks of it. That looks pretty fast. But again, we want it to... We don't want it to just run kind of nice and smoothly, right? We want it to perform well. We want the... Let's see, timelines. We'll be looking in another episode at this, but we want this code to be kind of gentle on our software. Sorry, on our on our hardware, on uh, on the computer. And there's ways that it isn't um, that we will look into uh, in the next episode. That said, um, you know, if you First of all, if you would like to try this yourself, uh, remember, you can fork this project and give it a shot. GitHub, ResMason, Wireworld Player. Uh, you know, you can click fork and uh, do what you will with the code. You can try to implement this, for example. Um, or maybe you can think of a way that runs faster uh, that wasn't done in this episode. And you can compare it to what we come up with in the following episode. Yep. We've got about five minutes left, so I will close by running timelines and seeing what happens see frames or events we're gonna do events and play maximum CPU usage 65% 66 and I don't know if you can hear this I'm gonna put my microphone up next to my laptop up to 70% usage. This is not a nice web app. Not at all. There's definitely ways to make it better. Especially considering how little it is doing right now compared to what we've seen the Flash version doing, which admittedly looked kinda gross, but still. And what we've seen the uh, the Gali implementation do, right? So, um, oopsie. Oh boy. Okay. So again, we'd really like to get to a point where this kind of performance. where the generation is now at like 10 million, right? Just seconds after I started it. We want to be able to aim for that kind of performance by the end of this project. We got a long ways to go, but... Uh, not that. There we go. But at least we got something.
You know what? I'm also going to look at... Let's audit. Accessibility. That's a cool thing to try later. Back to timelines. Frames. Play. Stop. I'll need to get better at uh, Safari's version of this, but I'd be interested in knowing what the memory usage is like. I wonder if this is the right tool for that. Possibly not. But then we can always swap over to, say, Firefox. Performance. Oh, memory. There we go. Um, so, advance, take snapshot, and then play, and then pause, take snapshot. Uh, is this a comparison? Yes, compare snapshots. Click, click. So it looks like, I, I could be wrong, but it looks like, uh, according to Firefox, running this it eats CPU, definitely. Absolutely. But I think I think it is not doing anything with memory, by and large, which is great. Although, you know, if there is a memory leak that's more subtle than that, um, it would take so much time and therefore so much CPU to uh, try it out, like to, to, to record the memory leak. Uh, that it wouldn't be worth messing with anyway. So, like, aside from the bug that I found, um, current problems. While the simulation runs, it can't be sped up or slowed down, and eats uh, just just you know eats CPU percentage. That's not the right terminology. Uh, uses CPU very heavily. Um, time to try some basic optimizations. Yep. Well, Local time is 9.30 p.m. And I am slowly, <clears throat> slowly turning into a pumpkin. I am parched as all get out and need to drink like a gallon of water. If you've reached this end, this edge of the, uh, of the stream, whether you're in chat or watching it as a recording, I thank you for coming along. Uh, this is trying to do I'm trying to do a a, uh, a smooth uh, signing off uh, this is res Mason signing out from the skybox in the uh, in the corner of the level <laughs>